Welcome to the dedicated astrophotography camera course. My main goal of this course is to show you how to buy, use, and edit your images from one of these fancy dedicated astro cameras. It's going to be a big change if you're used to using a DSLR, and there's a lot we got to cover. In this first video though, I'm just going to explain how you can purchase your very first camera, that way you get the best results and you don't waste your money. So the first thing we're going to look at is ZWO. These guys are kind of the leaders in the field at this point, as far as I'm concerned. That's because they have so many different products that work well together. And uh, for the price, I'd say they're a great option. You can also go with Attic or Atic. These guys make some really great cameras. They're usually more expensive than their high end, but they're worth taking a look at. And then you also have QHY, but uh, there's a kind of like the budget brand and I hear there's some compatibility issues. So I'm not really gonna talk about them today. ZWO though, that's what I went with. That's what I'm gonna focus on. If we go to their products page here on astronomyimagingcamera.com, we have deep space object cooled cameras. And that's what I wanna focus on today because these are really what you wanna look at. Before we get into the specifics, I wanna give you a general overview of how a dedicated astro camera works because it's a big change from a DSLR. The first thing you'll probably notice is that it looks nothing like a normal camera. There's no buttons, there's no LCD screen. It's really just a case with a sensor inside. And that can cause some problems because the only way we can even control this camera is through either a laptop or something like the ASI Air. And the way we do that is we plug in a USB cable to the camera here, and then we plug the other end into, again, a laptop or ASI Air. Then from there, you'll need some special software to control things like the gain or the ISO and the shutter speed, etc., and even take the photos. And if we look on the back, there's a little fan here. If you get a cooled camera, and I highly recommend it, you'll be able to set the temperature you want the sensor to be at. Whereas with the DSLR, we're stuck. You know, if the camera gets hot, it gets hot. But this, you can actually program it whatever you want it to be and within reason, of course. In order to do that though, you will need a power adapter cable. That's what this little plug is here. That'll power the fan and the internal cooling. But that's really all there is to the camera body itself. Another thing you have to keep in mind, and we're gonna have a whole different video for this, is what's called back focus. Very simply, all of your different lenses and telescopes, they reach a focus point, let's just imagine right here. And what you have to do is get all these different spacers and make sure that the camera sensor is located right here. If the camera sensor is closer, all your images will be blurry. If the camera sensor is out here, all your images will be blurry. And again, we'll have a whole never the video for this, but you have to get all these different little spacers. You'll get them with the camera itself, but it can be kind of a pain to even get a focused image right out of the box if you don't know what you're doing. So that's something you have to really think about is, do you wanna deal with all the extra headaches of one of these cameras, even though it does have some nice advantages over a DSLR? But that's just the basics of what a dedicated astro camera is. It's a little small, kind of like a webcam almost, and you're gonna control everything, again, through your laptop or your smartphone. The first thing you have to decide, and this is gonna be one of the biggest considerations, is if you wanna go with a monochrome or a color sensor. Monochrome is gonna be designated MM. Color will be MC. So whenever you see those, at least on ZWO, you know what that means. So let's take the 183 camera here. Same camera, except one is in monochrome, one is in color. You notice the monochrome right out of the gate is $200 more expensive. Now this is important here. A monochrome camera, every single photo you take is gonna be in black and white. What that means is that instead of just taking you know, 100 images with your DSLR of Orion, stacking them together and having a final image, that'd be kind of the same thing with the color camera here. With a monochrome camera, you might have to take four times as many photos. Take 100 with red, 100 with blue, 100 with green, and then 100 with luminance. That's just some imaginary numbers, you don't have to do that. But the point is, with a monochrome sensor, you have to spend a lot more time and money to create a final image. It's gonna be higher quality than a color camera, but you really have to think this through and see, do I really wanna spend all that time and money just to get a little bit better quality image? You know, that's debatable uh, how much better the quality is gonna be, especially if you don't do the greatest job on capturing the images and editing them. There's a lot of factors to consider. My thought process was, I've been using a DSLR for the past five years, it's been color, I wanna get better results, so what can I do? And I figured if I'm gonna make a leap to one of these new high-end cameras, 
why would I go with color if I've been shooting color? I might as well go all the way and get monochrome. That was my thought process, but you might have a different one. It's up to you to figure that out. For me though, I was willing to spend the money and the time and endure the steep learning curve. So I went with monochrome. And that led me to two cameras, the 83 here, 183, and then the ASI 1600. I was originally considering getting the 183 here, but ultimately decided against it for a variety of reasons. So let's compare the two spec sheets here for the 183 and the 1600. And you don't have to decide between these two yourself. I'm just kind of giving you the thought process I went behind, so it might shed some light on some important topics. Once you've decided if you're going to go with color or monochrome, I would argue the next most important thing is looking at the sensor size as well as the pixel size. These two are really going to determine basically how much zoom you have. It's very complicated, but the short of it is for the average person, if you're looking at your images, smaller sensors will give you more zoom. Likewise, uh, smaller pixels will essentially give you more zoom. And the best way to visualize this is if you head over to Telescope Simulator or telescopius.com. And if you go to telescopius.com, there's a telescope simulator. And this is gonna really help you visualize what we're talking about. First, you can input your focal length of whatever lens or telescope you plan on using. I'm gonna be using a William Optics Space Cat though, which is 250 millimeters. So that's what I've put in. I'd recommend changing this to whatever you wanna use. Then we have the camera's sensor size right here. Right now we're looking at a full frame camera sensor, a Nikon D750. And at this point, frankly, I think it's a little bit too much zoom because we can't really focus on one object. I mean, it's great that we can get two in one, but generally I want to fill the frame with the object I'm photographing. So that's one of the problems I have with the space cat is just that there's not a lot of zoom, at least for a full frame camera. But let's now change to the 183. It has a one inch sensor that's much smaller. 13.2 by 8.8 .8 millimeters. We can take those numbers, put it in here to our equation. So now look at the difference. We can completely fill the frame with the Orion Nebula and we're using the exact same William Optics uh, Space Cat telescope. The only thing that changed was the sensor size. That's pretty remarkable when you think about it. And there's a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes technically, but like I said, for the average person looking at an image, a smaller sensor is gonna give you more zoom. And frankly, this is the reason I was really considering going with the 183, because with this sensor size, it matches perfectly with a lot of the objects I wanted to photograph, and I think that would be a great composition. I could even go up to the Horsehead Nebula, get all that in the frame, same with uh, the Andromeda Galaxy, etc. If we go back to Orion though, now we're gonna swap over to the ASI 1600s sensor size. It's a micro four thirds. That's going to be a little bit larger. 17.7 .7 by 13.4. So we can put that in. And there we go. It's much wider now. You could argue it's a little bit too wide, but I think that's not terrible. And the other thing I was thinking about is that, you know, from time to time I could put on my 150 to 600 and I can maybe have 500 millimeters, and then I can really zoom in as far as I want to. So really that was my main consideration why I went with the 1600, because I felt that overall it was a more well-rounded camera, and with a little bit larger sensor I had more flexibility. As well as the pixel size is larger, that's going to usually translate to a little bit better noise performance. Uh, so the ASI 183 had very small pixels, 2.4, Whereas the 16 is 3.8, that's much larger. And this brings up a whole nother topic, which is called arc seconds per pixel. I don't really want to get into that too much in this video because I think it's going to just confuse a lot of people. So if you want to learn more about that, head over to my website. I've got a blog post here. It pretty much sums up everything I discuss in this video and goes into even more detail. Very simply though, if we scroll down here to this graph, this is just the easiest way to visualize it. This is from ATIC, they made this graph up, very nice of them. It really helps us out. So up top we have telescope focal length in millimeters versus the pixel size in micrometers or UM. And if you see a number in orange, that's good. So for example, 600 millimeters on a 
six micrometer pixel size sensor is going to give you great results. Usually we want to be in between around two to one. That's ideal for the numbering. You can even input whatever your camera's pixel size is divided by the focal length, multiply that number by 206, and that's going to give you your rating here that you can look on the graph. So again, I don't want to get overly technical here, but my Nikon D750 has a pixel size of 5.95. If we divide that by 600 millimeters, that gives us ultimately two arc seconds. That's perfect. Two arc seconds is a great number. However, if we use the 70 to 200 millimeter lens on my Nikon D750, we're getting 6.1. That's really not good. That's not enough zoom, basically. And we see 6.1 kind of down here. The technical term for that is undersampling. So very simply, undersampling means you don't have enough zoom. In this case, 70 to 200 isn't enough zoom. Uh, if you get over here, though, where you're going below the number one, 0.95 and smaller, then you have too much zoom. And you can see we're getting really high up in focal length here. So what you want to do is have the right amount of zoom for the size of your sensor. That's really what it comes down to. And if you just look at the equation up here, plug in your numbers and just make sure you're between one and two for your rating. If you do that, you're good. If you're higher than two, you're going to be undersampling. In other words, you need more zoom. If you're lower than one, then you, don't, you have too much zoom. That's really all that means. Hopefully that makes sense. I recommend reading the article though and just really understanding all of this. Getting back to my decision though, between the pixel size and the sensor size, for me, I thought the ASI-183 was just a little bit too much and I figured a much safer choice, especially for my first camera, would be the 1600. So that's what I decided to go with. And again, I recommend doing your own research on all these different things and how they're gonna correlate to your current setup and use Telescopius for that just so you can visualize how it's all gonna look. One other important note, there's a website called Cloudy Nights. I'm sure most of you have heard of this before, but they have a really great forums. And if you even just go on Google and type in, you know, ASI 1600, uh, let's say Amp Glow, that's kind of a normal problem cameras have. One of the first results is Cloudy Nights. So the point here is that Cloudy Nights, if you have any kind of questions about a camera, it's probably already been answered on the website and then you can quickly see if you're gonna have some problems or not. So this is a great resource when you're buying your first camera or anything else for astrophotography. All right, I think we've covered enough in this very first video for the course. In the next video, we're gonna talk about filters and how they work with either monochrome or a color camera. Just to recap though, make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, I recommend going with ZWO. You don't have to use them. There's other manufacturers out there like Adic, Attic, whatever it is. Uh, but for ZWO, we have the deep space cooled cameras. You can do monochrome MM or you can do color MC. I decided to go with monochrome because I want the highest quality images possible. I also had some money I could spend on the filters and I have plenty of time to invest in this whole new workflow. If you've got a tight budget or you don't have a lot of free time, then frankly, I think the monochrome camera might be a mistake just because the amount of work you're gonna have to do to get a final image is gonna be noticeably longer. And for some people, it might just not be worth the extra headache. But then again, you know, if you're gonna get a, a color camera, you might wanna just stick with your DSLR for a while. You can get still get great shots with the DSLR. You don't need one of these fancy cameras. Either way, if you decide you wanna go with a dedicated astro camera and you've said, and you know, maybe I'll go with color or mono, the next thing to look at really is the pixel size and the sensor size. As we discussed, smaller sensors in, in some aspects are great because if you have a relatively short focal length like I do, you can still get a great image. That's really the way I think about it. If you've got a big telescope though, like a thousand millimeters, then in that case, you're really gonna fill the frame. There are ways to reduce that. There's this term here, Barlow or reducer. I recommend doing your own research because we don't have time to get into that. But basically you can you know, reduce things or make them larger with certain optics, uh, but that's getting above the scope of this course. So make sure that you not only use Telescopius to verify that it's gonna work with your current lens or telescope, also check out my website and also this chart and do your own calculations to make sure that you're not gonna be undersampling or oversampling. Once you've got all that figured out and then finally, you can start looking at the more technical features like quantum efficiency, 
full well capacity, etc. That's getting a little bit overkill though for your first camera. Most of these cameras are gonna work just fine and you don't really have to worry about how sensitive it is to light, especially if it's a monochrome camera, you know it's gonna be pretty darn sensitive. And the full well, that's just like how much light it can capture before you clip the data, uh, very basically anyway. There's one more thing I forgot to mention and that is the fact that these are all cooled cameras. And if we scroll down here, you can see there's a little fan on the back. There's also a heat sink and some other components inside the camera. And you can actually control how cold you want the camera sensor to be, which is really awesome if you're coming from a DSLR where we have no control at all. And this is the back of the ZWO cameras. We have USB ports. These are gonna to connect to your laptop or the ASI Air. And then we have a little power adapter here. I wanna be clear, at least the 1600 does not come with the power cable that you need to power the fan and everything. The camera will still work, but you won't have any of the cooling features. So when you buy your first camera, if you're thinking about getting one, make sure it comes with a cable to power it. If not, in my case, what I had to do was buy this little ZWO adapter cable. And I would recommend just doing some more research on that for yourself. Make sure you get the right type because you can buy them on Amazon for cheaper. The ZWO one's like 30 bucks. Uh, but you will need that cable to power the cooling system inside the camera. And then we'll talk about actually set all this up later on in another video. I just wanna make sure I included that as well because if you were to look at their planetary cameras, for example, none of these have any cooling. They're very simplistic. And uh, that's just something you gotta watch out for. If you're buying a dedicated Astro camera, generally you wanna make sure it has the ability to be cooled. And the cheaper ones, like these guys here for planetary, do not have any kind of cooling built in whatsoever. So make sure uh, you keep that in mind as well. So I hope this video cleared up how to purchase your first dedicated Astro camera. Again, my thought process was I want the highest quality image as possible. I've got money, I've got time, I'm going with monochrome. And I chose the ASI 1600 because it seemed like a good overall camera. If you don't wanna invest in a filter wheel and filters and spend a lot more time taking your images, stick with your DSLR or consider upgrading to a color camera and that'll simplify the workflow quite a bit more. All right, well, in the next video, we're gonna talk about filters because that's a really critical component of your setup and there's a lot we gotta cover there as well. If you have a question, you can leave a comment. I can't really get into specific camera models. Uh, again, that's why I recommend using Cloudy Nights. It's probably already been answered over there and uh, that's all I got for you today. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next video.